Coming up, Matt Dolphin continues his look at the PC shows from the 80s. I check out the ZX Pico MD. And I play some games. Let's get on then. Welcome back to the world's most long overdue show review. It's 1989 and there's only one game on everyone's mind this year. See if you can spot what it is. If you said Renegade 3, Renegade Through Time, then I'm afraid you were mistaken. Let's jump in and find out. In 1989, the PC show returned for one last hurrah, bringing the 80s to a close in style. Show number 12 was held at Earl's Court Exhibition Centre, which became its new home from 1988 onwards. Despite the growing excitement for new machines from the US and Japan, there were two significant British products on the verge of launch. As Christmas 89 approached, which of them would make it to market first? Which of them might benefit from a publicity boost at the PC show? The 1989 show promised more than ever. The business hall would include the first glimpse of Apple's Macintosh Portable, plus everything businesses would need for reading barcodes or learning about desktop publishing. Building up on last year's international scope, manufacturers from Singapore and Taiwan would be demonstrating what they could bring to the UK. In the central hall, Acorn would join Atari in going for a village approach, surrounding their core stands with loyal third-party suppliers. Plus, there would be opportunities to learn about computer-aided design for animation or filmmaking. The Office of the Data Protection Registrar would be on hand to help companies struggling with the Data Protection Act 1988. The Leisure Hall would see the return of the popular Music and Micros theme, with plenty for MIDI users. The British Association of Computer Clubs would have its own area, with 16 different clubs on hand to help connect people to like-minded users. And of course, there would be more games to play than ever before. 1989's advert was reduced to A4 size. Taking the form of a comic book, it saw Captain Light pitted against Dark Destroyer, who wants to spoil everyone's gaming fun but it's nothing that can't be resolved by a swift kick in the nuts. I guess the business publications had a different advert. With the tickets having arrived safely in the post, the next job was to read up on any show previews in the press. Remember Newsfield's 18-page PC show supplement in 1988? Well, this time you'd be forgiven for wondering if they were even going to be there. There was nothing in Crash, and only a minor feature in The Games Machine, which at least paid lip service, but there was no sign of the usual rapid enthusiasm from Newsfield. Elsewhere, we had New Computer Express, who provided a map, but little else. There wasn't much information up front this time. The 8-bit machines are no longer the focus for most companies. So as we look back at this year's bag of goodies, will there be anything for devoted Specky fans? It's Saturday the 30th of September 1989. Once again, I'm here with my brother and some friends. Thanks to my first real part-time job, I'm taking a healthy sum to the show for the first time ever. Also this year, I'm looking for a crash replacement. Perhaps I'll visit Newsfield to ask them why my favourite magazine has turned into a pamphlet that doesn't fit in my crash binder. The first stop is PCW Magazine. The glossy guide is printed on the thinnest paper yet, but the price is still £2. The map is still confusing, having lost the exhibitor names last year. The product index seems baffling at first, but is actually very clever. Say I want to get a new joystick, which I do, then I just need to search for joystick in the product index and then use the reference number to find a list of suppliers. One place I won't be finding a new joystick is the business hall, which is described by the guide as lacking the immediacy and excitement of the other two halls. This is largely academic for our group. We can't get into the business hall due to the technicality of being under 18, so there's no option but to skip it and go on to the central hall, defined by the guide as less serious than the business hall, but lacking the anarchy of the leisure hall. Amstrad have placed themselves at the front of the show, metaphorically with both feet in the business hall and their little toe slightly in the central hall. Oddly, they haven't mentioned Sinclair in the guide or any of their home computing products focusing instead on their business machines. But all is not lost. The Spectrum Plus 2 and Plus 3 can be found in new ZX Spectrum action packs, accompanied by a new light gun which has been made by Trojan Products, who already make light pens. The action pack comes with six games including Operation Wolf. 
I pick up a ZX Spectrum Action Pack Flyer. Considering where we've just been, a visit to Future Publishing tells a surprising story. I buy the latest edition of New Computer Express, and there is a big scoop about a new Amstrad Games console. The console will be Z80 based, but Amstrad are highly secretive about it. The issue also has a review of the new Spectrum compatible Sam Coupe, something I've been following avidly all year. With the Amiga out of reach for me financially, the Sam looks like a cheaper upgrade from my Plus 2. The magazine review is positive about the machine, though it does caution of being very late to market. It's a shame then that Miles Gordon Technology have not managed to make it to the show. Acorn are hoping to gain a larger piece of the home computing market with their new A3000. With most of the benefits of the A400 series, they have managed to reduce the price of their premium machine. It's hoped that this addition to the Archimedes family will be the natural upgrade for schools, with its friendly user interface and amazing art and music capabilities. I collect an A3000 brochure and move on to the leisure hall. First up, Ocean have the best positioning, just like they do every year. They also have the most anticipated game, Batman. The film's not even out yet, but we've already heard the soundtrack by Prince, and been subjected to what feels like the biggest marketing campaign for a film since, well, ever? It's only natural that I pick up lots of bat merchandise, including a bat hat and a bat bag. Ocean's promo brochures are here, in the shape of the 1989-90 game plan, and have changed into tiny leaflets, presumably so that they fit in cassette cases. As well as the free biz, I buy the Spectrum version of the New Zealand story, a recent Crash Smash and a favourite arcade game from the summer. A sticker on the back says, see us at the personal computer show. These stickers appear to be on almost every stand, but as I'm already here, who are they aimed at? Blade Software is a new company putting Julian Gollop's creations into some smart packaging. Laser Squad is being promoted at the show, with five missions and a promise of expansion packs to come later. With the game on my Christmas list, I grab a giant Laser Squad poster. It's going to look great on my wall, contrasting nicely with my Linda Beard wallpaper. Moving on, we arrive at US Gold. They've opted to fill their stand with arcade machines on free play, in the Arcade Hall of Fame, showcasing past and present arcade classics. Call me cynical, but could it be that they don't have many actual new products to show this year, and are working hard to conceal it? I can't get near the machines, but I do buy Forgotten Worlds, another recent Crash Smash. Next, I visit Powerplay Limited. I've found somewhere to buy a new joystick. The latest version of the Cruiser comes in a striking colour combination of green, blue, yellow and pink. As well as the joystick, I collect a nice flyer and a Powerplay business card, in case I feel the need to contact the sales director. It's time to visit Psygnosis, who are promoting their most ambitious game yet, Shadow of the Beast. An 18 cassette Spectrum version seems unlikely, and I don't have an Amiga, but I love the artwork, and instinctively grab an A3 poster. Imagine my shock when the Psygnosis sales team demand a pound coin in return. What is the PC show coming to? After looking disgruntled, I hand over a pound, but I make up for it by swiping two Psygnosis carrier bags. Next, our group visits EMAP, the magazine publisher. It's a good time to renew my search for a crash replacement. Casting Sinclair user aside, I buy the latest edition of Ace Magazine, which tempts me with a feature on the PC Engine, and yet more excitement about the Sam Coupe's imminent arrival. Ace also comes with a free booklet, the Ace Challenge. It begins by looking back at computer development, then examines incoming hardware, ending on a challenge for the computing world to come up with the perfect machine for the 1990s. The magazine fits nicely in an EMAP bag. Nearby, Dennis Publishing are launching a new games magazine called Zero, which stands for zany, entertaining, readable and original. The free pilot issue, possibly known as Zero Issue Zero, gives a good idea of what the magazine will be like, and it carries on with a Your Sinclair style of humour. There's a feature on Batman, in case you hadn't heard about the film. For console fans, there's plenty to read in Console Action. The pilot has a preview of the forthcoming Conix console, complete with motorised chair, a light gun with recoil action, and several games in development. Interceptor are busy promoting Xenomorph on their new Pandora label, on plenty of formats, except the Spectrum. I like the artwork. Where do they get their inspiration? But all is not lost for Specky fans, thanks to Player's Premiere, Interceptor's 299 range. There's ghost hunting fun in Spooked, and an early demo of Joe Blade 3. I pick up a Xenomorph poster, and a copy of Spooked. For a game centred around a wizard, I don't think the cover artist was given much to go on. Signal Research Limited has journeyed all the way from the US of A, ostensibly to introduce us to Games Players magazine. Across the pond, there's great interest in Nintendo's first portable console, and two hot new properties to choose from for your living room. But this US magazine has something that British magazines simply cannot provide, 
Yes, it's Will Wheaton, choosing his favourite Nintendo games and helping Patrick Stewart to set up his new Macintosh. There are a few discount software sellers at the show, not least Software Plus Limited, who have more than 20 stores around the country, with more on the way including one at the Kingfisher Shopping Centre in Redditch. That's near me! I buy the Bard's Tale at a special show price. Houston are here again, unveiling their new logo, building on the Lizard from last year. They are moving into 16-bit territory, bringing some of their most popular 8-bit classics to the more powerful machines. This is bad news for me, but good news for my friend who owns an Amiga. I do okay though, picking up Stormlord and Cybernoid 2 at a discount, and also getting a Cybernoid poster. At last, the moment has arrived, arguably the highlight of the leisure hall. Our trail has brought us to Conix Computer Products, and here it is, the Conix Multisystem, complete with actual chair. I really want one of these, just imagine if they bundled it with Space Harrier. I don't think it would fit in my bedroom, so we'd need to come to some sort of arrangement whereby I could keep it in the living room and balance the family telly on it when nobody is watching neighbours. I also buy another joystick, the Mega Blaster. I don't think it will be as durable as the Powerplay Cruiser, but for 6 99 it's pretty inoffensive. I also pick up two bags and the multi-system flyer. Virgin Mastertronic is getting very crowded, as the company now covers Sega, Melbourne House and Leisure Genius. Thanks to their agreement with Sega, they are still pushing the Master System while everyone waits for the official release of the Mega Drive. Mastertronic are pleased with their new 16 Blitz campaign, bringing budget games to the 16-bit machines. From Virgin Games I buy Shinobi, based on a recommendation from a friend at the show. It's quite a haul then, I get Shinobi with a free sticker, the Master System brochure, 16 Blitz flyers and a badge. This year British Telecom discovered that there was a software company buried within their business. Confused executives then sold it to Microprose, so it seems to be in safe hands, despite the smaller stand at the show. It's great to hear that the programming legend Pete Cook is working on the Spectrum version of Stunt Car Racer under the Micro Style label, and I pick up a copy of Times of Law, another Crash Smash. Grand Slam Entertainments have popped over from Croydon to show their latest wares. There is plenty for 16-bit machines, but they also own veteran labels Quicksilver and Bugbite. The main attraction for me though is the new Thunderbirds game, which apparently does well to evoke the spirit of the TV series and comes with all sorts of goodies in the box. Finally I visit Domark. The show guide says that they specialise in challenging games which require coordination and thought. While that may be the case for Pictionary and Hard Driving, I'm here to collect a copy of my other favourite arcade game, Zybots. The Spectrum version missed out on a Crash Smash, but it looks faithful to the arcade. As well as the game, I pick up an A3 Zybots poster. And so, on Sunday the 1st of October 1989, the PC show closed its doors on the 1980s, after the biggest and most successful show ever. Were you there? To my mind, this was the very best show. It had everything. The 8-bits were still trying to prove that they were a thing, the 16-bits were well established, several new exciting consoles were on the way, and there were still some signs of British innovation. On top of that, I came back with a huge haul of games, posters, joysticks, bags, stickers, badges, magazines, far more than any other. How could the 13th PC show possibly top this? There was much excitement for 1990, a new decade, an advert in the 1989 guide. But despite the advert, the personal computer show would not return, and the business and leisure markets finally went their separate ways. The leisure section was reborn as the European Computer Entertainment Show. Still at Earl's Court, the focus was now on 16-bit computers and the growing console market. What was left for Spectrum users? Not much. For me, the glory days were over. For 12 years, the PC show brought us not just the latest software, but quirky hardware peripherals, homegrown innovation, and enthusiast groups. And all at a time when home users were learning what their machines were capable of, this sparked imagination and creativity. By the early 1990s, I had joined the console consumers. The Sam Coupe did make it to market, and although it was a case of too little too late, it was a fascinating machine that kept me tinkering for many years. And what happened to Earl's Court Exhibition Centre? After years of abandonment and multiple owners, ambitious plans were unveiled in 2023 to turn the wasteland into an exciting urban village including housing, businesses and leisure space. All very nice, but a piece of history is gone forever. We can't end on a low point though, 
Why would we, when we're here in the 21st century, decades after these shows took place? There's a new Spectrum next, the return of Crash Magazine, new hardware, groundbreaking new software freed from the shackles of publishing deadlines, dedicated YouTube shows like this one, and most fitting of all, new computer shows where we can meet up and celebrate all over again. When Atari released Star Wars into the arcades in 1983, it was an instant hit. I have you now. The popularity of the film meant everyone wanted to blow up the Death Star and become Luke Skywalker. The fast vectors, speech, unique controller, and even better if you could find one of the sit-down cab, made this a superb experience. Released on the Spectrum in 1987 by DeMarc, it wasn't the first attempt to produce a Star Wars type game for the machine. Death Star Interceptor from System 3, Death Star from Rabbit, Dark Star from Crystal Computing, and of course Star Strike from real time. Even Parker tried to produce the game for the ill-fated Sinclair ROM system, and the prototype of that does a pretty good job, but obviously not completely finished. Back to the official release then. We get a nice rendition of the famous tune before we can pick our control methods. And finally on to the game. We can select the difficulty, all looking very familiar so far. Once into the game and, well, the sound is missing, there's nothing at all. Flying around in space, blowing up ships and missiles, all in silence. I tried a few other versions of the game in various formats and still no sound. I changed the emulator to various settings and still no sound. I looked at the reviews in magazines and none of them mentioned no sound. I watched the walkthrough video and no sound. A huge disappointment. All the unofficial versions had at least some kind of sound. The graphics though are nice but not as smooth as some of the others out there and there's good use of colour too. The control is crisp and the game plays quite well, although on easy setting I did avoid shooting the missiles in the trench by just staying at the top all the time. As each TIE fighter zooms towards you, you feel like it should be screeching, but it's just silence. There's no speech either, and this was promised by DeMarc in a magazine preview. I suppose they did it either because of speed issues or because they ran out of memory, and the inlay does say run the game in 48k mode on 128k machines. For those who don't know the game, a quick overview then. You play Luke Skywalker trying to blow up the Death Star, a massive space station the size of a planet. To get there you first have to fly through space and shoot the enemy fighters, and more importantly dodge their shots sometimes called missiles, sometimes called fireballs. Survive this, and depending on the difficulty and progress, you will drop onto the Death Star surface where you have to shoot the towers, again still dodging missiles. Eventually you will get onto the famous trench scene, fly down the trench, dodge the gantries and missiles, and finally shoot the exhaust port, which will cause the whole thing to explode in glorious circle commands and silence. It's a competent game, but without sound it just feels a little bit flat. This is Kane, released by Mastertronic in 1986. According to the inlay, this is an all-action, thrilled-packed arcade game. 
There are four levels, each having their own challenge. You play a sheriff trying to make peace with the Indians, or as they are called now, Native Americans. The first level and the sheriff, assumingly named Kane, runs onto the screen. A very brightly coloured screen that actually makes gameplay a little tricky. You move a crosshair around and shoot the ducks. You have to compensate for the height and speed of the ducks, as well as the angle of the arrow. The crosshair is limited to the left two thirds of the screen, so although you can go chasing the ducks, you'll have to remember this. Your arrows often go straight through the ducks as well, not registering a hit, which is very annoying. The main character is nicely animated though throughout all of the levels, and sound is used well. I'm not sure why shooting ducks would help peace talks, maybe he's going to cook them a nice duck lorange later on. You have limited arrows here, but you get one back for each bird hit. Once all the arrows have gone, and you have killed enough birds, you can move to the next level. Here you ride a horse across the plains, jumping over rocks and plants. Nice animation, but the gameplay is very frustrating and slightly flawed. If you fall off in between two obstacles that are closer together, you can't get enough speed up to continue, which means you continually lose lives. You can turn around and get a run up, but that doesn't always really help, and there's often not enough room to do so. If you complete this journey, counted down in miles at the top left, it's into a shootout. You arrive at a small town and various people appear in doorways and windows. It's never explained who they are, you just shoot them. You have limited bullets and if you use them all up, you just have to run around until some more turn up. The people do shoot back, randomly hitting the ground that you move across, so if they get lucky, you lose a life. If you get past this, it's back onto the horse to race back and try and get to the front of a train. Again here there are things to jump over and more objects that are closer together. And this became very, very frustrating, even with unlimited lives. The collision detection is very strict, meaning I could only get part way through this without having to revert to cheating. Sound and graphics are used well throughout, with some nice animation in places. And it's not a bad game for 199 really. If you are not interested in why, who, where and what with the story, then it just turns into a multi-part arcade game, and for 199 you can't really go wrong for that. The Sinclair ZX Microdrive, released in 1983, after over a year in production, gave the users a much needed boost in both storage and loading speed. It couldn't compare with the much more expensive disk systems, but it provided 80k of storage and an impressive speed increase. Modern replacements have emerged over the years, including the excellent V-Drive, a device that fits inside the original microdrive case and uses an SD card to load and save files. Another option is now available in the form of the ZX Pico MD, created by Tom Dolby. This is a device built around the Raspberry Pi Pico and comes in its own 3D printed case. It has the usual edge connector on the right hand side along with two lights, one for ready and one showing activity. On the left there is a through connector for other micro drives and the micro SD card slot. And on the front are the control buttons. 
The device still needs Interface 1 however, which is not a problem if you have a working one. The buttons allow you to navigate various functions, moving forwards, moving backwards, selecting, resetting, etc. Connecting is easy, you just plug it in as you would a normal microdrive, and you also have the option of connecting more Pico drives or real microdrives on the side. You will need an SD card formatted and ready for files to be added. These can be anything found on the internet, like the Sinclair demo cartridge or the games cartridge, or you can even make your own in an emulator and then copy it across and Tom provides special tools that allow alternative methods. The screen looks very clear, although it played havoc with the frame rate of my camcorder. The Pico MD can swap cartridges in and out across all eight microdrives, so you can have all eight working simultaneously. Let's start with the Sinclair Games cart then. You use the buttons to browse the SD card, select the folder with your files in, pick the file you want, select it, and at this point the Pico MD recreates the microdrive cartridge ready to use. A quick reset of the spectrum and the run command and it loads as you would expect, emulating the microdrive speed as well. I've tested this on a series of different spectrums and it worked fine. Let's go with Ant Attack, a great game and the only one officially released for the format. The device has a small built-in speaker with different volume levels to mimic the microdrive motor. Even on the loudest setting though, it was quieter than a normal mag drive, at least for me. It is important to note that this is not an SD card loading device like the DivMMC. This is emulating a real micro drive, and things will not load instantly. I did notice, however, a real cartridge that had proper tape in it would begin searching for the next file where it actually stopped. So if you loaded a typing game and then reset, and loaded another one that was stored straight after it, it would be very, very quick. However, if the file was at the other end of the tape, the microdrive would have to seek all the way through the tape first before it could load it. Tom Dolby confirms that the location of the current seek is stored, and will only be lost if you turn the power off, so the emulation is really top notch. When I had a real microdrive, I spent ages changing the loading commands of my typing games and my basic games to work with microdrives, many happy hours, and this was recreated when I got this device. Sadly, a few of my last games were on microdrive. When I sold all my kit to a friend, hoping that he would not format the cartridges, the first thing he did was format them. I was gutted. I have every single game that I wrote back in the day, all on tap format, but the last two were lost forever. Anyway, onward. Let's format a cartridge then. We select a cartridge as normal, one that you're not bothered about losing the data on, enter the normal format command, and off it goes, the familiar black and white border. Once complete, we can do a catalogue of it, and this shows you have 127k of space, which is more than a real cartridge. And this sort of explains something that we'll come on to later. Now with an empty cartridge, I wrote a small basic program, and using the normal Sinclair microdrive commands I can save it. quick cat to show it's there, a reset, and I can load it back in. Everything works just as the real thing does. You can even use a multi-face with it. You load a game from tape, hit the red button, Select the save option, select microdrive, and away it goes. Once it's saved, you can reset the spectrum and load it back in. If you want to get games onto cartridges easier, Tom provides several tools to do this. Z80 on MDR is one such tool. Let's build a games cartridge then. On a computer, gather some Z80 files together in a folder. I found it easier to make my own Z80 files rather than use old ones which sometimes took longer to process. Now entering a command like this, 
And I say like this because there are many options to use, and this will move all the Z80 files onto a brand new MDR image, and create a small menu for you. Put this MDR image onto the micro SD card, locate it using the buttons as before, press reset and run, and we get a nice little menu. Here's a compilation of the ultimate games. You just simply pick a game and off you go. Yes, the load times are slow when compared to things like the Div MMC, as mentioned before, but still faster than the tape, and much more nostalgic. I know many people just want to load games as fast as possible. Well, that's fine. Use a Div MMC. Some, though, like myself, like to dabble in our past and relive those days when loading a game from Microdrive seemed like witchcraft. It seemed so fast compared to those old tape recorders. If you have an Interface 1 and your microdrive is broken, this is an excellent replacement, providing better reliability. It also has one more trick up its sleeve. If you place a TAP file or a Z80 file directly onto the SD card, you can get the Pico MD to do different things. When you're using a TAP file, it will read it, create an MDR image, and move all the files across. Now this is not a conversion tool. If it's a commercial game, it probably won't work, because you'll need to edit the loader to add in the microdrive commands. However, if you use a Z80 file, this will create an MDR image with the game already on it, ready to run. So all you need to do is reset, enter run, and the game loads. Now onto some speed tests then, and my game I always use is Birds and the Bees. On tape it took 2 minutes 12 seconds, on the real microdrive it took 17 seconds, and on the Pico MD it loaded between 19 and 20 seconds, just slightly slower than the real thing. This is because the Pico cartridge is larger than the original tape one, running in at 254 sectors. It rebuilds each cartridge on the fly, even from older download files, to keep things more reliable. The real tape cartridge only has 192, so when it's emulating a microdrive and looping through the pretender tape, it will take slightly longer. However, using the method around Z80 files and creating your own from within the Pico MD reduces that significantly. Birds and the Bees varied between 11 and 3.5 seconds, with an average of about 6, and that is pretty impressive. If you want a more reliable, 100% compatible and more flexible option in place of your existing micro drive or alongside your current one, this is a great option. To get the best speed from it, it would be better to make your own cartridges using the Pico and then use Tom's utilities to add games. This is why, when loading the compilations created with Z80 on MDR, things move much quicker. A really nice piece of kit then, and something to consider when looking for a reliable microdrive experience. <laughs>